who I was before and who I am now. And when I see high risers, it's just an amazing thing to know that I have a great opportunity to continue to build high risers and, and build California, Los Angeles. There was a lot of heartache and a lot of pain and a lot of things that I had done in my past that caught up to me. And at that time, that's how I know what goes around coming around. So this is why I'm always trying to help somebody and I'm always trying to do the right thing and, and not try to get into them kind of situations to where that karma can come back on you because it, it, it's, it's, it's real and it's true. It's hard because being a uh, black inner city youth, tattoos, ex gang member, been, a, been incarcerated, it's hard. A lot of people won't accept you, but they opened up and told me, if you leave it outside and you come to, you know what I'm saying, work willing to learn, then, then you're just like I am. You, you're a brother to me. You gotta be ready and you gotta be sick and tired and then you just got to do it. You know, I, I was lucky the doors opened once I became clean. One thing after another just happened. You know, when I, when I was done, my life just got better. A lot of people are afraid because they've been told no so many times that they don't even want to ask anymore. You know, and it's really sad. So what I do is I try to give encouragement. You know, I try to, by example, you know, this is my life here, and I'm putting it out there for you to look at it. Got a beautiful little daughter. You know, and every day I'm with my son, I try to make up that lost time you know, as much as I can. You know, he doesn't know what really happened. He has a vague memory of that dad was at work, but it's, you know, you just, you just try to make it up every lost time, every lost day, you know. People deserve a uh, second chance many times in life, depending on what it is, but they, they deserve an opportunity to, if they've paid a debt to society for whatever they've done wrong, um, they deserve an opportunity and they belong here too. Well actually, I don't, I don't know that anybody purposely goes out and rec recruit, recruits uh, gang members or, or, or people from, this, from, from that, that portion of the community, but I think uh, what happens is because our industry doesn't require a background check. Um, we uh, we seem to have a a larger amount of people in our in our rank and file that come from that that part of the community. We recognize that uh, people need second chances. They need uh, the ability to to get good jobs that they can transition into, uh, where they can use uh, their minds, their physical abilities, uh, basically to uh, give them an outlet and feel positive about what they're producing. The best social program in the world is a job. So if they've come from a life that uh, they've been in and out of the penal system, they've never had real opportunity before, and they've probably not been able to earn a living without resorting to crime. But here there's a different chance, a different way to do it. This effort on the part of the building trades, I think, is an important one. Giving people the skills to maintain uh, a good job that they can support a family on is what we want to do, I think, when people have paid their debt to society. And I think the trades can, as they have in the past, provide a new path for individuals that have, the, have had those kinds of problems and that if they're willing to turn their lives around, the building trades crafts and contractors in our industry won't turn their backs on those young people.
My cousin Chris told me there was an open door at the Union Hall, so I went down to the Iron Workers uh, Apprenticeship Training Program and uh, signed up to be an iron worker. Um, later that day, I called uh, Anning and Johnson, which was the decking company, and asked if they would sponsor me. And I started to work like two days later. Like Robbie, he was working at a in a warehouse making nine or ten dollars an hour, and he didn't he did not want to take a day off when I told him I could get him a job. And I told him, I said, you have to go down there. I can get you a job right away and I'll get you set up. I'm 37 years old and I really never had a good job or anything. I mean, any other job I ever had, I only made $7.50 an hour or $6.50 an hour laying block or, you know, just odd jobs. And they never paid enough to get me anywhere in life. I was thinking this was my uh, last chance. It was the chance of a lifetime and I better do the best I can do from this day forward. My cousin who's uh, he's the assistant uh, business manager in our local he saw that I uh, got out of prison and he's like hey dude are you are you gonna go back or do you or do you want to uh, do something with your life and I was like well I'm always gonna say I don't want to go back and I'm always gonna say I want to do something with my life he says well if you're interested He's all come in, apply, take a test, and uh, we'll get you moving. Donnie Salcedo, he's an apprentice. Uh, he's, he's doing great out here. He's a young man who's trying to raise a young family. I, I was accepted with open arms. All right, we got a, a young brother that's coming in, that's willing to learn. You know, it didn't matter I was black, it didn't matter I was a blood, it didn't matter if you were a crip. If you're gonna show me something, I'm willing to learn. I uh, did an 18-month prison term, and I was paroled, and I had resided over here in East L.A. in Boyle Heights in the community, and I was um, seeking for employment at that time, and I was uh, helped by the, a program called uh, Homeboy Industry, founded by Father Gregory Boyle. You come here and you kind of learn about what's expected from you, and you sort of, we break them in a little bit, and then they, and then he was ready. He wasn't ready when he first came here. I mean, it was attitudinal and difficult and angry. And, and then, you know, I think he got to a place where he was ready to, to, to do this. And it, so it was a perfect combination of his readiness meeting this opportunity. I met uh, Robbie Hunter from Ironworkers um, Trades. He told me that there was jobs out there and that they were looking for people as myself that were strong, tough and there were people that would not give up and just pretty, pretty much willing to learn. It meets our needs. We need, we need tough guys and, and uh, these guys uh, have the street toughness and that they can put it into this work if they're serious about it. I mean, there's no free ride. Iron working is one tough trade. So I was looking for something that I could get involved in that was going to keep me busy to where my background would not be an issue and um, I talked to some members of the UA and they suggested that I get involved in, in the pipe fitter, steam fitters program. And this is where I am now. I can remember walking into the office and I was speaking to two gentlemen and I asked them, I told them I needed a job. At the time, I really didn't know how the union worked or, or, or the proper uh, protocol for the union. And instead of them looking at me as an African-American say, you know what, dude, you need to get out of the office. What they did was they gave me some tools to guide me through. Gangs in some respects are a reflection of the human need to belong to something, to be a part of something. The issue that we have so much concern with in society is the behavior of the gangs. I could care less if we had 40,000 people belonging to gangs if they weren't out breaking the law and if they weren't so violent by nature. Well, growing up, my hands were soft as a baby's ass, bottom line, because I didn't do no hard work. All I did was, you know, sell dope, uh, gang bang, no work. Whereas before I had, they say called hustler hands. <laughs> <laughs> so they were real soft, so I can touch a one. Oh, his hands are soft. I never worked. When he turned around about 14, I think 15, that's when he 
start turning and going the wrong way. I mean, I'd always preach to him against not doing drugs, selling drugs, or being involved in, but some kind of way somebody convinced him that this was the way to go, you know. And uh, evidently the, the glamour of having the money and quick money and stuff like that, it appealed to him. He basically told me he just was made the wrong choices, a couple of the wrong choices, fast money, you know, the gang life was the fun life, hanging out with friends, drinking, smoking, you know. But then I guess he realized now, but he always spoke to me about it and always was against it, for, you know, for me. But let me see that what he done and I learned from his mistakes. Yeah, I went to Crenshaw, but I did not complete Crenshaw. What I completed is a long, lengthy prison sentence. That's what I did complete. But through that, when I got out, I had to figure out to do something. I couldn't go back to uh, gang banging and selling dope. That's what I couldn't do. So the very community that I've destroyed is the very community that I build now. When he took that dramatic fall, when they uh, caught him in Chicago, and they kept him all them years up there, I mean, that's, I guess that's when it really stuck into his mind, you know, this is not the way to go. So it wasn't nothing for me to wake up in the morning and you're in a dope house, or you're sleeping in the back of an alley, or you're having guns on you while you're out in the corner selling dope. It was normal. But I realized one of the things that I found out talking to some of the, my peers, one of the things that we all pretty much had in common was we felt we didn't have nothing to live for. And so I would, I would almost assume that when you don't have nothing to live for, that your, your mentality is, I'll do anything. And whenever you get around someone like that, that's an individual that's not conscious of self. It was actually really hard for me because I didn't ever want to see anybody like that. Like, just knowing that they're at a place where everybody controls them and they can't leave just any time they want, they can't do anything, everything is controlled. So I, I really didn't like that. The transformation happened to me when I was in prison. And I kept saying, am I really this beast that I was portraying myself to be? Or can I be an individual that can be productive? Well, as a child, uh, I didn't have a father. And pretty much I was seeking for attention. And I found a lot of friends that were pretty much in, in negative attention. And so I just started being a part of the guys. And we got involved in drinking, smoking weed. It all started pretty easy. He was just, uh, how can I put it? Julio just, he was uh, um, the guy to go to, you know what I mean? Like if, if, if we have problems, like I just said right now, I'm contradicting myself again, we'll just go to Julio, you know? He was just, not that we couldn't handle it, but he, he, he was more like, a, like, our, like we'll look up to him, you know? I was really aggressive. Uh, I, had, I didn't care what I was really hurting people. I just pretty much became really, really active in gangs. Uh, I, I, I was in and out of juvenile halls. Uh, from leading from marijuana, it became into getting into heavier drugs, cocaine, sniffing cocaine. Uh, at a young age, approximately about 15, I found out that being with the, with the guys brought me a lot of strength as far as uh, feeling secure about myself. Well, my dad grew up without a father, and it was really hard for him. My, my grandma would do everything just to help him out, and yet he wanted to run the streets at a young age, but it was just hard with, for my grandma to deal with him, but it was a young age and just hanging out in the park with his friends. Perdido, drogas. Robos, cárcel, balazos, todo tenía Julio en su vida. Era un caso perdido. He got shot about, about five years ago, and um, it was over. It was, I remember him telling me it was over just, you know, like, you know, what are you looking at? You know? What are you looking at, you know? And boom, this guy just shoots him, you know? At about 16 years old, I was committed to the California Youth Authority. I spent three and a half years and I thought that was gonna change my life. But right there, it just was the beginning of more destruction in my life. I became going in and out of uh, county jails. At the age of uh, 33 years old, I ended up going to state prison. I had a drug problem and I just didn't know anything else. That's all I was grew up in, that's all I knew, so. I ended up going to prison over it, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I went back and forth for 15 years. He's always worried about the cops on him, always worried about his parole, you know. 
Worried about going back. Didn't didn't ever want to go back. Life with drugs is a never-ending nightmare. You know, you're you're always looking for something. You're always you're never at home. You know what I mean? You're always from this place to that place to this place. You know what I mean? You have no life. There's Robbie on drugs and then Robbie off of drugs. It's a completely different person. You know, now he's an iron worker. Like I said, he's got money in his pocket, money in the bank. Well, for people that have troubled backgrounds, you know, you just got to look forward and don't look back. You know, remember where you came from and, and just try to do the best you can. You know, go, go take one step and put it in front of the other. In my childhood growing up, I felt lost. Um, I didn't know who my father was. My mother's away incarcerated. I got involved with the bloods, um, passing in Denver Lane bloods. And like I said, they were people like me. So I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to feel the same camaraderie, the brotherhood of the people that had both parents in the home felt, somebody that they can go and relate to. And the bloods at that time to me were my father, my mother, my friends, the, the tightest network group that I knew. Yeah, he had it rough. I had it rough, you know. I had it rough, you know. Like his mother got shot and killed, you know. You know, he was still a little, I don't know if he, how old he was then when his, before his mother just disappeared one day, you know. I know that hurts him to this day still. Stealing cars, fighting, batteries, robbing people. I did a lot of things, I mean. I did so much stuff that I got myself incarcerated in the California Youth Authority. I, I, I did it all. He was an angry little kid. He was angry. And I guess he took it out on society at large, you know. He was angry. I, that part I do know, and I knew where the anger stemmed from, too, you know. I felt alone. I felt everybody was abandoning me. I felt like, damn, my granny died, my mom's in jail, my dad doesn't want to know me. What's the use? So I do the same thing to you. I'll take something that you got to make you feel how I feel. That's the, that's the irrational thinking. That's the process of, of what builds up in you. We met at school, so I mean, we were at football games. I mean, I never actually hung out with him in Pasadena and he was, to me, he was past that when we met. And then it's hard to see your two and three year old kids growing up and they wanna know why do you got uh, monkey bars? Uh, why are you in jail? And then you gotta try to explain it to them the simplest way for them to understand that you can't do what I did and think it's okay. Why would you make that mistake, you know? Why would you jeopardize us? And she, you know, our daughter was so young, you know, so he missed out on her, almost her, almost two years, you know? It was going on two years, so. You know, that's what really upset me. That's what upset me when he went to jail is my kids was gonna miss out on their dad. To be honest with you, what I was thinking about in prison was just staying alive. And I'm pretty sure some of the same thoughts probably went through his head. You know, the, the way he was going, you know, is just jail's institution of death. You know, so you have to make a change, you know, you have to. The only thing it took was two years and four months of sitting down, really thinking about what's going on really thinking about where I want to be in three or four years. What I want to do to show my son, well, you ain't got to do this. What I want to do to show my girls, you ain't got to do this. That's it, long thinking. The only thing I ever knew was really paper, paper and pencils. And uh, so when I came into this program, I had two left hands. I mean, and that's, 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 that's the truth. Um, it really didn't matter which hand I weld with because I wasn't good with either one. The only thing that James really said to me was that he was working in corporate. So he wasn't really working out of his field because in most cases, most of our young individuals that have worked corporate and come into the trade normally drop out. But this wasn't the case with James. After I graduated from college, um, I started to, to uh, get involved in the computer field a lot. And um, I allowed my um, lack of responsibility and my lack of maturity to get me into trouble. But he came to me very respectful and, and, and I, was, I was really surprised. Very well spoken. My white collar crime uh, was around banks and um, hacking into their systems and transferring of funds and, and so forth. 
and uh, that is a federal offense. And it's punishable by 10 years in prison and, and multiple fines. And uh, I am living proof that they're very serious about what they say. Well, everybody deserves a second chance. Anyone that has served time or paid fines or done whatever they need to do within the judicial system is according to them. Then as far as I'm concerned, they're upstanding citizens that paid their dues and now they have the opportunity for entrance into our local union. I learned a lot when I was in prison. I grew up. Um, you know, I thought that I was a man when I went in there, but I found that I was more of a man when I came out of there as far as responsibility and just thinking the way that I should be thinking. It's a lot easier to adapt and communicate with a person who either one knows where you come from, has a similar idea where you come from, or has been through the same struggles. Um, I, I've learned that James is from back east. He came out here to California to better himself. You know what I'm saying? Just as if being an older black male, I, I feel I can go to talk to James about certain things. And it's unfortunate that I had to go down that road, but you know, situations in life happen and uh, people make mistakes. And it was just one of those things that I did. And unfortunately, I have to live the rest of my life with that mistake, you know, but it doesn't stop me from growing as an individual. Most of the time I grew up like in uh, foster homes, group homes, boys homes, uh, McLaren Hall, you name them, I've pretty much been there. <laughs> you know, me and Donnie, we didn't, we didn't have our fathers growing up, so they were our sort of male figure to look up to. You know, the, our mothers controlled the household, but when it, we were out in the streets, you know, it was really our friends and older homeboys. The hardest thing of growing up was not really having that relationship with my dad. I don't know if it would have probably been a, a good thing to have the relationship with him. I might have probably ended up worse than I was or better, who knows, you know, maybe it was for the better, but I never really got to, you know, experience that. We have people that have been involved uh, from early childhood. I'm not talking just fell into it in late high school. Some of them were around it from uh, day one, had brothers and uh, uncles that were that were living that life. and almost part of their fabric of, of their neighborhoods. The things I, I did while, well, you know, they came from uh, burglary, robbery, assault, uh, attempted murder, got dropped to bodily harm, uh, manufacturing uh, drugs, possession, sales, and Oh, it, it, it could go on. He actually got, uh, went to youth authority, you know. I actually went to go visit him a couple of times. It, it was really bad at the time. It's, it's not a good place, not for, for a teenager to be sent out to youth authority so, so young, you know. So I ended up going to prison and uh, I spent uh, four years in uh, High Desert. Where it's about in, uh, in the city of Susanville, I believe. Susanville, it's about 15, 20 minutes from uh, 20, 30 minutes from Morgan State Line. And it must have been tough for him, you know, knowing that you have a child out there, your son, and, and you're, all you get is uh, pictures, because they, they didn't have the means or the, to go visit him in prison. So, yeah, it, it, it was a hard time for him. Not only did I uh, lose uh, contact with the mother of my children, uh, well, actually the mother of my child, and uh, my son, it uh, you know, they just you know, I was there and I I, I missed every you know, I missed the first what year of his life, two years or the first he was two years going to be two. Every time I every time I talk about it, even though as big as bad as I am, and I feel like, oh, dude, you know, it's like you know my son and I know that he had a hard life, um, but. I guess he wanted to change his life, you know, when he got out of prison. He wanted to change and so he tried. Fell a couple of times, but you know, at the end it was okay. This time I really noticed that I really I really felt it when he when he talked to me that if he had the opportunity to get out that he would come out a different person and, and really try to be an honorable guy in society, so 
and that's what he did. The people I grew up with, you know, to see them like, you know, jacked up, you know, like sucked up on drugs and, you know, uh, it hurts because you just like, you want to help them, but there's only so much help I could do because I got two kids that I'm trying to keep in line and do what I can for them so they don't end up like me. You see a lot of outreach into the community because our union, almost 8,000 members strong, is reflective of this great city, this uh, tapestry that's Los Angeles. And so you see an outreach into many different areas to give opportunities. What's going on here today is there's a, what we call a career fair. It's basically, uh, all the unions have apprenticeship programs, all the building trades. Uh, any part of something, building a construction thing has an entry level and it's through apprenticeship. And we, we do everything from the refineries to petrochem uh, to uh, uh, hospitals, uh, the medical gas, the plumbing. This is our plumbing local in Los Angeles. We do all aspects of piping, regardless of what it is. If it's pipe, we do it. Well, I work here to be 18 years of age, willing to work hard, GED high school diploma, transportation and ready to work every day. No drugs, drug free, and come to work every day ready to rock and roll. We're, we're on a big campaign drive for basically youth. I'm here to let you know that if you choose not to go to college, you can get into these trades no matter what it is, electrician, electrical worker, iron worker, and it's a lot of other ones. No matter what you do in life, you have to have a certain amount of um, you know, fortitude and a certain amount of initiative in order to be successful. The, the biggest characteristic we look for, I would have to say, would be heart. A person's uh, stamina, a person's mental ability to overcome pain, working in the heat, basically heart would be the biggest. I talk to young people today, that's, that's what I, I tell them, like a lot of them tell me, oh, you must be a pretty tough guy, you were in jail and stuff, and I tell them, no, it's, it's not being tough being in jail, it's being tough being out here working every day and paying your bills. That's a tough man. That's a man that takes care of his family. Um, we have a program within the uh, IBEW called the Electrical Workers Minority Caucus, and part of our outreach has been to outreach into the community to help um, with the interest exam. Every third Saturday we do a tutorial session. We study from a really good study guide that's been proposed and we go over all the sections that they're going to encounter within the test. We're going to be covering the questions from uh, 11 to 20. Uh, we're going to start working on those and uh, we'll be walking around giving you a hand in case you have any questions, okay? It's been great for the community because we've been able to outreach into people that, first of all, didn't know the union was actually available to them. And second of all, how to know that we're serious about outreach because we're spending our time to help people within, within the community that didn't have any, didn't know anybody in the union, you know, didn't know anything about it. Okay. And there was no work, you know, there was no work for the heat to go, it just started eating away. These guys here are on their own nickel. They aren't working, they're not being paid. It's a 16 week program, okay? They got, they, they, they got the guts to, to, link, uh, to stick it out. They're gonna do good, it's, it's gonna, they're gonna prosper from it. We all know how we got here. A friend, a family, Mr. Vasquez, another union, brother and or sister, all right? My name's Matt, I heard about this uh, by my uncle, who's a pipe fitter. And I'm from uh, Orange County, so. Welcome, man. Jordan Brent from Pasadena. I heard about it from my brother. Good morning, my name's James from Long Beach. Um, I pretty much heard the, uh, about the program to, uh, uh, from my cousin and uh, the other, um, Action Jackson. Okay. And that's why you're here. You're going to be hating life. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's going to be the best thing you ever did. It wasn't a problem. Somebody did it for me. 
And someday you're going to be standing up here doing it for somebody else. It's just the way it is. I talked about brothers, right? And sisters. That's what we all are. In order to be a welder, you have to have certain certifications. The, the precautions that are taken are, are just extreme. They really are. It's very important um, that the union gets involved in this because they're the ones that are sending us out to these refineries to work. The, actually, the process of safety does start with the union. Welding is constant learning. It's life. Every second you're learning something new. It's a new position. It's a new body position. It's a new arc angle. It's, it's just constant learning. If a patient learning. If you're not patient, then I, I wouldn't suggest you do it. It's two pieces that I have packed together, and I am going to infuse metal in between the two pieces in order to combine them together. When you go into high school, a lot of your tech classes, you know, uh, automobile, welding, those types, they've dropped them. Schools have. They point, you go to college. Well, not everybody's going to college. And a lot of people out there, they're good with their hands. The pipes run usually 40 feet at a time before there's even a, a, any type of a saddle or a dis disconnection to them. And they are everywhere. They're under the ground, um, they're under the sewage system, they run through the, the, the uh, uh, subway stations, the train stations. Um, our major facilities um, that take care of us, our government, they depend on their piping work, you know, to be done well. Yeah, you get people, you know, been in prison. I've, I've known several of them. Um, but like I say, you know, it's, it's, uh, that doesn't mean that's who they are now. You know, everybody get, you know, deserves a second chance. He's learning how to do it, and I'm learning how to do it. And so when he comes up on something that's really good, the next the thing to do is you go tell the person next to you or the person around the corner. Or... James and Jordan have already built a relationship, a bond between themselves. They're, they're helping each other. They're assisting each other. And that's what this is all about, the, these trades. They're learning how to set iron in a very safe environment. As you see, they're the first beam going five feet off the ground. Not, not bad, though. He got around good. He made the right move on the inside. Uh, you see how important it is to have your bolts ready? It, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a safety issue if you're not prepared to start working. It's always been open to anybody that's physically able, bodily, you know, mentally strong enough to do this work. I'm a second period apprentice, and uh, I'll be third period apprentice in about two months. And uh, the pay just goes up, and eventually I think it's around 36 or 37 dollars when you turn out. Right now I make about 16 something, 16.75, something like that. Well, Michelle has been an inspiration. Um, she was in the union before me, and it was just like everybody I seen. Oh, my my cousin Michelle's in the Iron Workers Union. I want to get in the union. You know what I mean? And I said that for about three or four months until actually I got a chance to get into the union. It, I'm very proud of her. My next class is going to be rigging, and that's to do with cranes, like all, getting them hooked up and sending up loads onto the building and everything like that. Stay there. Take your spud out. Give it to me. If you don't have a holder. Get your other bolt in your other hand. Right now we're doing structural and we're putting up the buildings and working with the cranes. That's what I'm learning right now. They get treated the same. They got to do the same work that we do. So Michelle comes out and kicks ass just like everyone else does. I'm in a six period apprentice right now. So I'm about to turn out in about six months from now. And so I'm really excited to get that opportunity to graduate and be a journeyman. And uh, it, it just, it's, it's awesome. The basic wage that uh, I make now is about $34.09, and if you add it all up with the package benefits, um, it's like around $51 an hour. Conduit bending, I think, is an art, personally. You know, when you can get all your bends looking the same, going, coming and going to where they need to go, straight, man, it's, it's beautiful. It keeps your blood flowing, you know what I mean? You don't get old fast. Let's put it this way, they were working on a retirement, an annuity, raising a safe family, is something they never had before. Well, I can say that since my pops went around when I was growing up, is that a reason for me not to be there for my daughter? I don't think so. All I remember is my daddy always telling me, 
don't worry about it. I'm gonna I'm make it. I'm gonna become something. I'm always I'm gonna make a better future for you. I'm a, I'm and that's what he did basically. See, and when he talks about something, 99 of 100 percent, he basically knows what he's talking about. And you can look it up any book, any paper, any dictionary, whatever. He knows what he's talking about. Now my friends are individuals who take care of their family, own houses, and get up and go to work every day. Those are my friends now. Some of my game banging buddies, I mean, they still my friends too, but when I talk to them, it's all about, hey man, if you want to change your life, let me know. And I can help you when you want to help yourself. He stay down the street from me. Know the same people I know. I know he ain't a phone. So to know that and to see where he came, came from, to come up, I mean, he's a prime example, oh, I can do this. I can do this for my kids, my family, my mom. I'm tired of my folks crying. And I met him at church, and actually he had probably been going to the church for a couple years before I finally even really started talking to him. In a, in, a, in a different world, these two dudes couldn't talk to each other. Because the neighborhood he from is notorious, and his neighborhood is notorious. But through the unity of knowledge, they all, you know, just won. I don't know how many times I done came to work and cried on this man's shoulder and told him that, man, I can't make it. I mean, I don't want to come to work, I ain't getting up, give up. You know, and he'll still be, you know, the bird on my shoulder, man, you got to get up. It ain't just about you. And the key is to be a leader, provider, and producer. You cannot do that if your mentality is inside of a box. When people are from where we're from and they use the excuse that they have to do what they have to do, they put themselves in a box. I went, I went to the holding tank for 12 hours and I was like scared straight. <laughs> That's right. That was enough. I, I got two boys of my own that I need to I need to raise to be men. So if, if I if I keep doing the things that I'm doing, I'm not gonna be there for them. So I just had to change my lifestyle, change my life. He always goes out and try to encourage people to get into the electrician like the program and he's always dropping off little brochures and explaining what he does to young younger people. So I think, and he always lets them know like how much money you could make, like how, you'll make a lot, so it's worth it. I think he has a lot to teach them. He can teach them how to turn your life around and do the right thing. All they have to do is pay attention and be there. My son's a really dominated defensive player and also an off offensive player. He plays with a lot of character. Um, he's, he's had some great tackles today, uh, very key blocks on offense told me that it was, what he got involved in was nothing good, that it doesn't lead to nothing good in life, that it just leads to destruction and doesn't lead you to a good path in life. I was just pretty much just caught up with the buddies and you know, got, got myself incarcerated at a young age. So he's able to fulfill something that I was never ever able to fulfill as a child. I always desired to be a football player for high school. And I always watched the other people playing football. And today, I find myself watching my son. This park brings a lot of memories to me. Here's where I basically grew up. You know, it brings a lot of memories of how we came about from, from our, our gang, from the Evergreen Boys. And um, it was just wild back in the days. My daughter just got, came out of the hospital. Please don't push my daughter, please. She's sick, okay? Please, she just got out of the hospital. Please, why did, why did you guys push each other? Well, because I was out there and she wanted to do me like a tornado and do the work touching me. No, don't go on the swing no more, mama. Sit down, just sit down right here. On June 15th, approximately about 6.30, Afternoon, my, my daughter was struck by a hit and run driver in the city of East Los Angeles. She's stable, she's, uh, she's moving, she's talking, uh, she's alert, she's walking, and she's just ready to go home. Really thankful for the iron workers giving me full benefits uh, with the great insurance to be able to cover the situation that I'm in right now with my daughter's health. He's different, he's getting closer to us. He's trying to stay more together as a family from what he used to be. And now we see more to, most of his kids, he's more into his church, and we see something very positive with him, which we like and enjoy. My daughter, she's just 
uh, she's been a blessing to me. She, she's been my inspiration of fighting stronger and fighting further in life. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, she was there, you know, fighting for her life, uh, being struck by a hit and run vehicle, uh, just, just opened up my heart, opened up my sight. Well, I've been confronted many times asking if I wanted to get in cruise or or if I wanted to smoke a cigarette or do a drink, but I have always said no, that my life is more better than for me just to step down and lower myself just to do that kind of stuff. And it brings a lot of joy and a lot of happiness to my heart. You know, and me, myself, I'm able to tell my son everything that is right and everything that is wrong. And I'm happy that he's able to observe and listen and follow opposite directions that I did when I was a kid. It's the best father a son could ever want. What more can I say? Ready, set, go. You got it. For me, everything needs to be perfect when it comes to homework and studying, and, and I, I, I thrive that for him, you know? I believe math is very important in life. Math and reading, everything else, you know, fall into place, but math and reading is very important. When I first met him, I just, I liked him right away, but we had problems. Remember how I told you, I think I told you, you know, uh, a woman could make you or break you? Wow, uh, I finally, uh, figured out this one kind of made me. Uh, he's a very happy man right now. He just bought his first house. It's actually, it's actually gonna be, you know, I talked to him and he really got teary-eyed with me because he was all like, you know, I'm about to start my family. Like in reality, it's a fresh start for him. She's, she's, she's really outspoken. She'll, once she start hanging around for a while, she'll start jumping on you and talking to you. She'll sing, she'll tell you ABCs. He takes me almost like everywhere. You they like? spoil me a lot. I always wanted to go with my dad. I always uh, wanted to be with my dad, but it just wasn't possible. He says he's gonna take me somewhere. He takes me somewhere and gets me something. That's what I like about him, cause when he gets me something, he throws something in there. Yeah. That's why, you know, wherever I go, I'll, Tell my son, let's go. No, Dad, I don't want to go. Nope, let's go. You know? And uh, we go. Hopefully he has a, bit, uh, a lot of memories with me <laughs> that he could talk about to his kids. Because I don't have any that could tell him about my dad. About his house, he's going to have, he has a beautiful son, a beautiful daughter. He's going to take his wife and start a new household. And it's, to me, it's, it's, I'm very proud of him. Very proud of him from from where he started to where he's at now. He's I'm I'm I'm, I'm very proud to call him my friend. Down south. I I grill my son the hardest out of all of the little kids that come out to practice with him. I make him run the most. I make him throw the most. So by the time he's eight or nine, he ain't thinking about trying to be a crip. He ain't thinking about trying to be a blood. He's thinking about this football in his hand and what this football can do for him. You know what I'm saying? I want my girls to grow up knowing who their mom is, who their dad is. That's the main thing right there. I want them to know who I am, who their mom is, and all that. He works, you know, makes his own money, you know, and I make mine and it helps out. It works out a whole lot better with two incomes, you know. It's much easier. I don't feel like um, the weight is all on my shoulders, I guess you would say. It's, he's, he's really the one taking care of his family, you know. All right. Look, hey, hey, listen, 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 Cole, 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 listen. They, they, they won't let us have our black wristbands, right? So if I don't say red, just look at your hand, and we already know the black is the left side, right? Go, go, red, go! This year will be my son's first year in flag football. So that's going to be his first family that he knows outside of his immediate family, the football team. So I feel that if I can deter him from
from getting bored where he depends on the dudes down the street, you know what I'm saying, then we'll be all right. Like the welding, I mean, that's the majority of what he would talk to me about lately is him welding, like his last job site. So that's what I like about it, about the, the whole union thing. It's like he's got something that he's gonna, I think he's gonna stick to, you know. I'm coming to welding with a clean slate. I can lay a bead down and that's it. So, I mean, I'll ask if I get stuck, I'll ask. Body positioning, I'll ask. I think it's really important, especially to the man, that it's really important because they want to feel like they're taking care of their family. I'm glad he's trying to break that chain and stay with his family. I hope he instills those values that he's learning now into his own kids. And that's how it's done. To break the cycle to me means that if I'm there for my sons and my daughters, like my father wasn't there for me and my sister and my brothers, or whatever, you can stop it. They're, they're my brothers and sisters. They're, you know, they're my, actually my new life. That's one thing about the union. They're, you're, you, once you become a brother, you're a brother there forever. I mean, you, you take an oath to help a brother iron worker in any way, shape, or form in any way possible, and they really believe that. The shift comes when uh, they realize that uh, the loyalty to uh, their comrades or, or the people they're working with went from uh, maybe a street organization to uh, now they're union brothers that uh, basically hold their life in their hand and they hold uh, their partner's life in their hand when they're working together. And when that person is Latino and, and a black man is watching his back or vice versa, that speaks a lot louder than, a lo than some of the other rhetoric that you'll hear in your neighborhoods. You have a real sense of the fact that people will treat you respectfully no matter what color they are. We have this thing amongst each other that there's no race colors. We love one another. We're a brother union, and we look out for one another. I consider those guys friends. I've ate at their houses and, and interacted with their kids, with my kids, and we go to the movies and play ball, and, and they're white. And um, I know that they don't look at, they look at my character and my way of life. And then they also understand my culture, too, just as well as I understand theirs. I'm not trying to, you know, I don't go to NASCAR, but then they don't go to the basketball games, you know, like, so. Hey, it all, it's all fun. We make jokes about everybody, you know, so, but you learn. It's about binding together. It's about the solidarity of workers working together to better themselves. White, black, Catholic, Jew, Asian, whatever ethnicity, whatever gender, whatever sexuality, I don't care. I look more towards young people. Uh, I'm very much into young people and uh, what their views are because they just don't know the opportunities that are available out there. You know, you're 21 today and then you're 40 tomorrow. And in between that time, not a whole lot can happen if you don't allow things to happen. We are all 250. We're all local union 250, no matter what you are. And you're to carry 250 on your back to the best of your ability. Whatever you do and go out and represent 250, that's how it's gonna be reported back. Not the black kid Jordan, not the white kid Jordan, not the Hispanic kid Jordan, the, the, the apprentice from Local 250 got his job done with the help of this journeyman and this foreman and this steward. That's what I've always been told. It's really rewarding for the individual to not only take care of his family and have all the things that uh, a good job afford him, but also to be part of building a community rather than tearing it down. And in the process of being part of uh, a craft that actually builds things in nature in this city, they get to see those things every day. They're almost a monument to their success. The idea that uh, can we make positive changes, I believe so. I look at some of the success stories that uh, Father Boyle has had. 
uh, some of the success stories that you can find in the building trades. And what we need to do is take a look at uh, not so much those that have not been successful, maybe spend a lot more time looking at those who have been successful. It's, it's not about how you treat your kids, you know, although that's an easy and good thing. It's really about how you treat the folks who are previously disposable and how do you work together so that we can cease throwing people away. So you want to get to another place. And, and that's a really exalted place to which we should all aspire, you know, even if it's hard. ¿Qué puedo sentirme yo? Muy orgullosa de mi hijo. Muy orgullosa. Dándole muchas gracias a la Unión, que por eso también fue lo primero donde él no se, senti se sintió con un sueldo mínimo, donde el sueldo de él era más alto. I can just stand amongst the crowd and feel very proud of who I am today. I don't have to feel less. I don't have to feel that maybe I don't make, I'm not as good as the next man next to me because uh, he makes better than money than me. I can stand next to a doctor and feel proud of myself because of my wages, because of who I am today. My hands are filthy and it doesn't bother me one bit. Why? Because I know I'm doing something productive. I could be out there with a gun right now sticking somebody up. I could be out there with a gun and shooting somebody and be ashamed of what my hands have done. But here, I'm not ashamed of dirt. It doesn't bother me. It's soap and water at home every day. Definitely, these are working man's hands. Well, I've got three kids, and, and it's like any time I pick them up or go anywhere with them, you know, it's like, oh, I look up to you now, Dad, you know what I mean? And uh, they, they have a lot more respect for me, and they, um, they're very proud of me because I've changed my life around for the better. No matter where the neighborhood, uh, where when you've grown up, in poverty, uh, when you've made mistakes, uh, when you haven't lived your life on the straight and narrow path, but you're willing to turn your life around, we should embrace that. We're looking forward to more partnerships with the City of Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Villarreal in making sure that uh, young people have alternatives to being involved in gangs or having to uh, have confrontations with uh, the police or the legal system. Well, it's still out there. You always gotta, you gotta watch yourself because some people do have a hatred mentality. And I just try to stay away from those individuals because I don't want to do nothing stupid. And I, don't make, and I try not to make no excuses because I was always taught that excuses were the nails to help build a house of failure. And, and I can't live that way. All I ask for the IBW is to give me the opportunity to compete, and they did. They gave me a chance to compete. And that's what I took advantage of, that right there. I believe in the brotherhood of the union. Um, even here in training, I represent my union. And um, you know, it, it, it's something that I take a lot of pride in, and, and, and it's a big responsibility too. And um, you know, in the, in the brotherhood, it's, it's, we have this little sanctuary to where we just sort of take care of each other, and we look out for each other. And we make sure that, that we have the things that we need in order to complete our work. And so it, for me, the union has been the best opportunity that has come up. Yeah, it feels good, you know. It feels, it feels real good, you know, to be able to go to work, to go to school, come home, you know, have dinner. And it's, it's like, that's life, you know. That's life, you know. And, and I, finally, I finally figured it out. You know, what is life to me? That's life to me. You know, everybody has a different meaning of life. What do you do? Why do you do it? I do it for my kids and my family.